morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'd like to welcome you today to the webinar entitled Integrating Green Wastes into Your Lean System. This webinar is hosted by the North Carolina Environmental Stewardship Initiative and the Division of Environmental Assistance and Customer Service. Um, I'm Angela Barger with the ESI, and I'll be the moderator of today's webinar. Um, this webinar is aimed at those who already use lean tools and value stream mapping specifically. However, we do have another webinar that we recorded previously. Um, it's posted on our website, and that introduces lean concepts. Um, I do want to let you know this webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to the ESI website, which is www.ncesi.org. Um, and the Environmental Stewardship Initiative is a voluntary program that promotes environmental improvement and leadership through recognition, technical assistance, training, and networking opportunities. Um, the ESI membership currently includes over 130 member sites across the state of North Carolina. Um, so if you would like to learn more about the ESI, you can also go to our website or contact Scott Fister or myself, and our contact information and our website address is currently being shown on the screen. Um, today's webinar, titled Integrating Green Waste into Your Lean System, and I would like to introduce you to today's presenters. Dan Stone and Sandra Carter. Um, Dan is the Continuous Improvement Facilitator at Leggett and Platt in High Point, North Carolina. And Sandra is the Environmental Manager for Daimler Trucks North America. Um, both Leggett and Platt and Daimler have participated in Lean and Green training events that ESI staff um, put on at their respective facilities. Um, Dan and Sandra will share their experiences with incorporating green waste into their existing lean processes, and they will also discuss how this has impacted their environmental management systems. So, all that said, please welcome Dan and Sandra, and now we'll be turning the presentation over to them. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dan Stone, and um, thanks for the introduction, Angela. Um, as she said, I'm with Leggett and Platt and High Point. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see the presentation okay and hear me okay. Um, what I want to talk about is, is how implementing the EMS here changed our perspective on lean manufacturing. On the uh, title slide there, I have uh, my contact information if anybody would like to get a hold of me about, uh, about anything that we talk about today. Um, just to give you a little background, um, Leggett and Platt is based in Carthage, Missouri. We make a wide variety of engineered components that are used in homes, offices, uh, cars, trucks, aircraft, and retail stores. The uh, company is 131 years old and has approximately 130 manufacturing facilities um, all around the world, and we're a member company of the S&P 500 Index. To give you a little bit of background about this specific facility, we're about a 220,000 square foot facility. About two-thirds of that is manufacturing, about a quarter is uh, warehousing and distribution, and the remaining space is offices and a furniture showroom. We have about 110 employees on the site here, and we manufacture a uh, wide variety of seating and bedding products, uh, including a lot of different kinds of springs, um, recliner mechanisms, uh, pull-out sofa sleeper mechanisms, and uh, some bedding products. We have about 5,000 finished good SKUs, and we're highly customized. We, uh, we tend not to run millions of the same thing. We run small batches of a lot of different things. We first started working on our environmental system just about five years ago, and uh, we chose to adopt the EFEC system. That stands for Enhancing Furniture's Environmental Culture. That was put together by an a industry organization called the American Home Furnishings Alliance, and what they were trying to do was encourage furniture manufacturers to incorporate environmental sustainability into their businesses. The uh, High Point Furniture Components Branch was the first Leggett and Platt facility uh, to implement a formal EMS when we became registered in uh, March of 2010. Since then, 12 more facilities in our uh, business division have registered in the same program. And Leggett has also chosen to, to use that program as a model for its own internal program, which has spread beyond just the furniture part of the business to, uh, to other business units. We are currently working toward compliance to uh, ISO 14001. 
And we have done a great deal of work trying to integrate the environmental management system, the uh, quality management system, and it's an ISO 9001 compliance system, and our safety program. And uh, integrating those really means that the management review process, continuous improvement, uh, the internal audit process, corrective actions, and things like that, the, uh, the, the documentation that we put together really covers environmental quality and safety altogether so that we're not trying to address those things separately. Um, with the size of our facility, that would not be practical to do with different teams and so forth. Talking about lean manufacturing, um, I've got a list here of the eight deadly ways. Sometimes it's seven. It just sort of depends on what your favorite acronym is, I guess. But uh, I've got it up here as downtime. And before we implemented the EMS, we worked on these downtime sorts of deadly waste. And uh, most of our continuous improvement projects directly addressed uh, some aspect of manufacturing that had to do with those. And so we would do projects like quick changeover, um, inventory reductions, uh, improving process repeatability, or uh, reducing scrap, that sort of thing, line balancing to reduce idle time um, or wasted time improve throughput, that sort of things. The, uh, the typical things that you think about with lean manufacturing. So what did putting in our EMS have to do with lean? Well, I think that focusing on environmental impacts helped us to sort of take the blinders off and apply lean thinking to a wider range of activities. Um, we certainly weren't doing the wrong things by focusing on eliminating waste in our manufacturing process. And our training programs focused on the, uh, the list of eight deadly wastes and the tools for attacking those wastes and uh, reducing or getting rid of them. But by doing that, we were still missing some uh, process improvement opportunities in areas that we didn't really consider directly related to manufacturing. And so I will say that the, uh, the list of eight deadly wastes is a great tool, but it in itself does not really encapsulate the lean philosophy. Um, and we might say that better as eliminate waste by optimizing value-added activities and getting rid of the non-value-added activities. In that definition of, of lean, um, I have purposely left the word manufacturing turn out. Um, and we do that because we want to apply that philosophy to all of our processes, and, and not just manufacturing, but that should include customer service, shipping, maintenance, um, workplace safety, environmental sustainability, and the management system itself. Um, and when I talk about the management system, I mean things like 14,001, 9,001, that sort of thing. Um, and so when we decided that we needed to take a wider view, we had to ask questions like, are these other things value-added activities? Um, typically, when you're looking at, at a process um, and you're looking you know, at a very detailed view, those things really are not considered value-added as far as a, a specific product goes. But as far as the business goes, I think that those things are value-added. And... Um, I think that they are because they all contribute to cost control. And cost control obviously allows us to uh, continue to offer our customers a good value for the money that they pay for our product. And so the next question would be, what about environmental sustainability? Is, d does that sort of fall into the same category? And I think that it does. Uh, I, I think that it, it certainly contributes to cost control. At least we, we found it so. Um, but it goes beyond that because consumers are are increasingly concerned about the uh, the environmental practices um, of the companies that they buy products from, and so to consumers that has value. Um, this is a cliche; everybody hears it a million times, but change is hard. I think sometimes we hear it so much that it sort of loses its, its impact, but uh, nevertheless, it is very, very true. And so through the years, we've gotten our, our manufacturing folks accustomed to making changes to the manufacturing processes. But when we started working on the EMS, 
and talking about changing our trash collection or uh, turning off light or reusing things, um, it was a little outside their comfort zone. And, um, you know, we, we got sort of the usual responses that, that you may expect when you talk about um, large-scale change. I'm sure some of you can sort of guess what some of these were. We've all heard them. So survey says, how about, uh, but you can't do that. Or this is the way that we've always done it. Or if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or don't we have more important things to worry about? And uh, lastly, you might hear, our customers don't care about that. They don't care about how we collect trash or what we recycle or that sort of thing. So these are, these are sort of some of the initial reactions that you run into when, when uh, at least we did, when we started talking about changing these things. So when we started out, the first team that we put together was what we call our employee awareness and education team. And uh, they created a really nifty mascot, Effie the Going Green Frog, um, which you can see the picture over to the right there. It's a pretty awesome paper mache mask that one of our employees made. And um, they basically educated the employees on what the program was all about. In particular, it was very important for us to let our employees know that, yes, many of our customers very much do care about how we are managing our environmental aspects, um, environmental aspects or impacts. Um, once we did that, we assembled four task-specific teams to address um, specific impacts. And those were um, recycling and landfill reduction, uh, utilities, pallet and wood management, and uh, packaging reduction. So those were sort of our four initial projects. Starting out with um, recycling and landfill per, uh, reduction, um, we might ask, why hadn't we ever bothered putting resources towards leaning this process? Um, well, other than process scrap, trash wasn't really considered manufacturing oriented, so we hadn't paid a lot of attention to it. Um, that solid waste disposal was considered just a fixed cost, really just part of our overhead. But when we dug into it, it turns out that it's not fixed. Um, we had a great deal of control over the process. And uh, we went from 41 tons of trash landfilled in 2009 out of this facility um, to none today. We're, we're landfill free as of recently. And um, there is a picture of our shiny new banner that we've got on the side of our building. So how has this leaned our process? Well, we've been able to cut the number of trash cans in the plant by two-thirds, and that's freed up our janitorial staff to do other things. And um, those things include cutting down sheets of cardboard to use in packaging, uh, repairing broken pallets. Those types of activities have cut down on the, uh, the number of new cardboard sheets and pallets that we have to purchase, so it's directly saving us money. We also, re um, I'm sorry, we also right-sized our, uh, our trash scrap and recycling containers. Um, there is a picture there of a uh, color-coded rack that we built and we placed all over our facilities so that people know which items get thrown in which buckets. The uh, nice thing about the five-gallon buckets is that um, unlike a 55-gallon drum, I can walk by and look in there and quickly know if people are using them correctly or not. With a 55-gallon drum, once it gets half full, who, who knows what's in the bottom of it? We have made our production departments responsible for uh, maintaining and, and emptying these uh, recycling centers. Um, it's really given them ownership so that they can't sort of blame other people like the janitorial staff when those uh, containers are not being used correctly. Um, and uh, finally, we've incorporated these stands into the, uh, into the 6S program in each particular department. And uh, 6S is, of course, another lean-oriented tool. Uh, moving on to utilities reduction, why hadn't we applied lean thinking to this sort of thing? Well, it's a similar answer. Um, you know, things like lighting, heating and air, compressed air, and so forth, 
those things were always kind of considered fixed costs. They were considered part of overhead. Um, there was also a matter of old habits or a work versus home mindset. Um, I know when I was when I was younger, I was just sort of taught that when you go into work in the morning, you turn the lights on, and the last person that leaves at night turns them off. Very different. You leave a room. Um, we just had a different mindset at work, and so we had to change that. Um, now, this is not to say that we just sort of ignored efficiency when we did a project that required new equipment, a new motor, new lighting, and so forth. But we had never looked at reducing those utilities as the primary goal of a project, and, and that changed when we put in our EMS. Um, our corporate group sponsored a couple of initiatives that helped out a lot. We had a facility-wide um, lighting retrofit, um, which had a significant impact on our utilities. We also installed GPS units in all of our trucks to track efficiency, and uh, we do run our own truck fleet, so that that is data that we can get that was not available before. And we also appointed an internal CI team to uh, pursue additional projects, and they did things like reduce night lighting, uh, programmable thermostats. They did some control improvements on our natural gas ovens. They applied uh, task-specific lighting to some workstations, um, added compressed air shutoffs so that we could isolate sections of the system, and uh, made air leak detection and other related things part of our monthly preventive maintenance checklist, um, which was a great system improvement rather than just sort of fixing something that's broken. Um, I've got some graphs there that show the results for both natural gas and electricity. The uh, blue bars are the absolute values. The green bars are adjusted to sales dollars. Um, and the reason I add that is because in the last five years, our sales have improved significantly. And so without some sort of normalization, you really do not get a good picture of, of the uh, gains that we've made. Um, moving on to pallet and wood management. Again, why hadn't we applied uh, the lean philosophy to that in the past. I think a lot of that was just, we always sort of thought that what we were doing was good enough. Um, another part of that is that, you know, we have bills and materials that say that a specific product gets packed on a specific size pallet, and so people rigidly followed, followed what, that, uh, what that bill of material says, and getting past that was sort of a case of knowing when to break the rules. Um, we did put together a team, and um, their initial task was just to keep wood out of the landfill. Um, and to do that, they, they put various recycling containers around, and they monitor those containers. Um, that's a good thing, because landfilling pallets, I believe, in North Carolina is now prohibited. Um, and then they moved on and did some other things, like determining where we could make substitutions. Um, they created a data-driven system for keeping track of pallets that we were retrieving from the field. And, uh, and so when pallets were retrieved, they would keep track by customer name, the size of the pallet, uh, the quantities, and who our truck driver was, and things of that nature. Um, and they put together spreadsheets where they could tabulate that data and review it to figure out if we were having any specific problems. Just putting that system into place where we had some accountability for our truck drivers and we had data collection uh, caused the number of pallets that we were retrieving from the field to, uh, to increase uh, very significantly. And uh, now, now, we know that, um, now we know if we have an issue with a specific size or there's a customer that we're not making pickups from on a regular schedule, we have that data and so we can address those issues. Um, this has not been without its challenges. Um, again, going back to the thing with the, uh, the ERP software and bills and materials, what we are doing is actually creating the material variance every month. Um, however, when we could show what the cost savings were, um, people weren't upset anymore about the, uh, you know, the relatively minor material variances that were created. It, you just sort of have to be able to justify it. And, um, there's a nice little chart, again, showing the difference that we've made in our pallet purchases. We've gone from roughly $48,000 a year down to eleven, and I uh, expect that to be significantly less this year, actually. 
And uh, our last team was packaging reduction. Um, this falls into a bit of a different category because this really is directly manufacturing. Um, we consider packaging to be a, a direct um, manufacturing activity. It uses direct labor. And so we had done some projects before that were typically oriented towards speeding the process up, uh, using less material. Um, we use quite a bit of returnable or reusable packaging, uh, permanent packaging rather than disposable packaging. Nonetheless, when we assigned a team to look at it, really from an environmental impact point of view, they identified a number of opportunities that we hadn't really gotten to before. Um, the first one, and, and to me it's the most interesting, is that we, we found a few products where we had excessive quality. We, we were really over-packaging the, uh, the items. Um, given how far they had to travel and the sort of handling that they were going to go through. And uh, excess quality really is, is a waste. It, 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 it's strange to say, and it's, it's, it's hard to talk to your people about that, too, because uh, you know, quality has been drilled into them. But uh, we don't need to make it any better than what it really needs to be. And so that picture there shows that where we were putting three straps on a skid of product before, we're putting two on now and have not had any issues because of that. A few other examples. Um, one of our products that was always packed in boxes for many, many years, we created a bulk pack and offered it to certain customers um, and saved a whole bunch of cartons by doing that. We're cutting down fiber cores to use in our manufacturing process. And this, this seems silly in retrospect, but we would receive raw materials on fiber cores. When that raw material was gone, we would throw the cores away, and then we would buy new cores to put our manufactured product on. Um, so now instead of doing that, we're just converting the cores from the raw materials. We, uh, we use an asphalt product really as a type of glue. And uh, we always bought it. It was wrapped up in craft paper and had a bunch of packaging. When we looked into it, we found that there was an asphalt available with a plastic packaging that you just throw into the melter with the asphalt. And it just, it just melts into the asphalt. So I thought that was really cool. Um, you, you essentially have no waste left over. And uh, we did some other things like sourcing bulk packed stretch film instead of buying it in little cartons that we would, had to dispose of. Um, so they found all sorts of little opportunities for us to um, reduce the amount of packaging coming in and going out. Um, these examples really are intended to show how the environmental system helped us look at things differently. Um, virtually all of those uh, projects had cost savings associated with them. And uh, these are projects sort of generated by a big picture approach to reducing our environmental impacts. Um, the uh, Sandra, the next presenter, is going to get more into the detail down at the process level. Um, as Angela mentioned last year, last year ESI held a workshop to demonstrate the green value stream mapping. And uh, that is a great tool to really drill down at the process level and, um, and uh, you know, really get down to some, some, uh, some details. Um, for things like energy consumption, water, um, materials consumption, trash generation, um, for specific products or specific processes. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to, uh, to Angela to introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Dan. Um, with that, now let's hear from Sandra Carter with Daimler. Um, hi, I'm Sandra Carter, the Environmental Manager with Daimler Trucks North America. Um, I've been asked to talk today about how we partnered with the North Carolina Environmental Stewardship Initiative to introduce a lean and green concept to our manufacturing process. Um, I'll also talk about some of the challenges that we, ex we experienced with that um, implementation and some of the achievement that um, we were able to make. Um, just a brief overview about uh, Daimler Trucks North America. We are situated um, across North America. We have five manufacturing sites in North and South Carolina, two, uh, one in Oregon and two in Mexico. We also have a corporate office in Portland, Oregon and Fort Mill, South Carolina. 
Most of you probably um, know us um, better through our brand name, Freightliner. But Daimler is a leader in clean drive technologies, and we are providing um, on-road and off-road vehicles, step vans and school buses that um, are alternatively fueled, um, including hybrid and electric. And we have produced over a hundred, I mean, excuse me, a thousand natural gas-powered um, trucks. And all of our manufacturing sites are equipped with the uh, natural gas filling stations. Um, almost a year ago, uh, we had um, Angela and Scott visit our site in Gaston, North Carolina. Um, this particular site is not manufacturing trucks, but they are a components and logistics sites, site for supporting um, truck manufacturing. Um, for this event, we com combined forces with our lean experts, the, um, which is otherwise known as the truck operating system. And we had six of those people and two environmental experts. Um, even though we run um, all of our improvement projects in environmental through the same tools um, that are presented in Lean, um, I wanted to work with them to uh, develop a system to be used during their normal CI events and being able to um, calculate the improvements that we made. We still have a lot of questions. Um, we wanted to start with the pilot and the things that um, we, we dealt with after the event was how do we prioritize all of the improvement opportunities that we found? How do we transfer this knowledge to all the other uh, CI leaders and, and communicating the benefit of what we were trying to achieve? So the exercise, um, we started with a value stream map that was used for DEF tanks, which are tanks that go on trucks that hold urea, which ultimately are used to reduce the NOx um, in, the, in the tailpipe. And these, these parts are stamped on a press line. They're welded, they're painted, and they're shipped. So, we took the toolkit that um, the uh, Environmental Stewardship Initiative group gave us and we broke it down into um, the economy and the environment and energy. We went out to these individual areas um, so it was a combination of shop floor experience and classroom discussions and activities. We, um, while we were out there, we used these sheets that were provided to kind of help guide um, these lean experts into thinking more about environmental. And I would consider it to be a very, um, more of a training exercise, an awareness exercise um, more than anything, but they were able to um, develop then, when we came back to the room, some list of things that they could work on. And the toolkit was um, intuitive because even though um, these people aren't energy experts or environmental experts, they actually gave us the categories. So when they were out looking at the environment, they would ask um, specifically about air emissions, water usage, um, solid waste, and whether or not um, they were recycling or had compliance issues. And from an energy perspective, it provided a list of equipment that we could look for. Um, lighting, motors, um, HVAC, boilers, other equipment, ovens, and um, facility type uh, questions like doors and windows, those kinds of things. So at this point, um, we took the seven green waste and we applied them back to the value stream app and we identified um, 38 green opportunities. So just on the press line alone, we had some 13 improvement ideas regarding energy, two regarding water, two regarding materials, two regarding waste, and so on. Um, 
and from that we created a list. And all I have to say about the list is that it, it can be quite intimidating. Um, you know, with one single CI event and 10 people, we identified 38 um, different things that could be done. And um, if you apply this approach, I just recommend that you uh, try to prioritize these so that um, you don't get bogged down in things that may require additional resources or policy or procedure and actually give the team some um, smaller priority action items so that they can actually experience a quick win. So after um, Angela and Scott left, we, I worked with this um, CI team to look through the list and evaluate the things that we thought that we could um, get accomplished rather quickly and um, that were low cost, and so we identified 13 of those, um, including things like, well, simply the fiber drum in that particular area was not being recycled because it was a combination of metal and cardboard. Um, so getting the bands back to the vendor and recycling the cardboard was one of the things that they worked on. and. Um, just identifying the number two reasons for rework. Um, and, and that's kind of the thing that we wanted to, to express, and I'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute. Um, so prioritizing into your low-hanging fruit and, and getting some wins for the team. Uh, some actions, um, like I said, require additional policy and procedures that may make this a little bit overwhelming. Um, this concept can be as big or as little as you want. And all I have, um, like I said, is advice is to not get bogged down in, uh, in all the, the magnitude and the details that you will find because there will be quite a few things that you're going to find that you can improve. Um, so the next thing that we really wanted to talk about was how do we transfer this knowledge and how do we integrate this this way of thinking into our existing continuous improvement activities. Um, and one of the things that the team came up with is creating a factor sheet. And I'll um, get into that a little bit more in, in just a minute, but it, it helps us calculate the improvements in terms of dollars and environmental impact. Um, we are ISO 14001 certified, so all of our environmental aspects and impacts have been identified. So we thought more about how we could visually mark those on the shop floor so that when they are having a, a lean event in the area that those are already pre-identified and that they can actually use those to guide their improvements. And looking at how we can identify those maybe on value stream maps ourselves within our system. So one of the things that we use to, to um, communicate um, how these are connected, and Dan just talked a little bit about the um, eight deadly waste, and we use the <clears throat> excuse me seven lean waste. And, and the, the information that I actually use to talk to these folks about is that anytime you have extra motion in work, you're going to be using additional energy. If you're um, creating overproduction, you're going to be using additional, <coughs> excuse me, additional energy and additional materials, and you're going to have additional waste. And in some processes, like paint and um, powder coating and those kinds of things, you're actually going to have water and um, waste associated with that. So in a way, um, the idea here is that the environmental impacts are already absorbed into these seven wastes. So from our perspective, we were looking for a way to bring that to people's awareness and to help them um, appreciate that the things that they're already doing are creating an environmental improvement. So we talked a little bit about, uh, the team and I talked a little bit about what would be just um, some 
a few things. I mean, we've got maybe a dozen things that would be valuable to a CI team that was actually going out to um, evaluate waste in an area. And these were some of the things that we came up with. Mostly, um, we, we tried to keep it in terms of dollars because ultimately um, that is a non-value add and um, ultimately we're, we're trying to drive efficiency in our processes. And when possible, we also linked it up to CO2 emissions. So for example, if um, in a value stream map, if you have eliminated transportation of a forklift, for example, then you could apply this factor and say, if we've eliminated 15 minutes on a forklift, okay, that means that we've saved X dollars in propane usage or X dollars in um, energy cost. And in addition to that, we've eliminated um, X pounds of CO2. So we've created a factor sheet um, of the things that we felt like were critical. Um, it includes things like when you go into an area, if you find that they aren't uh, recycling their cardboard or plastic or wood like they ought to, then they can have an understanding of um, the um, amount that would be charged to them if it's going into the garbage. Um, lighting, for example, we recorded all the different types of lighting that you might find in our facility so that if you're able to eliminate lighting, you can ultimately go ahead and calculate that improvement as well. And Scott actually provided us some information regarding air leaks and um, we were able to calculate um, how much money it costs to have air leaks so when the people are out in the area and they are able to mark those, they're able to calculate their savings. <clears throat> so when we're calculating um, or moving forward with the implementation, um, we have this um, factor sheet now so that we, it can be applied to all of our CI events. It makes environmental more relevant for the shop floor. Um, the, the thing that we're trying to do, too, is to eliminate the need for environmental experts at all green initiatives. So we're using it as a training and awareness tool. And um, much like Dan said, it really creates a common sense approach to reducing our waste um, and capturing the environmental impact of downtime, scrap, and transportation specifically. Um, the next thing that we, we want to look forward to is doing a more extensive training for all of our CI um, teams and hopefully we can use um, this first um, group that we had to spread the word and we want to start a tracking system for calculating improvements through these events and ultimately because of the energy concerns um, in a lot of the areas we talked about maybe whether or not maintenance or facilities should always be included on a CI event. Um, and I just wanted to recommend a book um, if there's any of you that would like to uh, kind of explore the concept more. There's a book called Creating a Lean and Green Business System um, by Zoki and Lovins Hood and Hines and it kind of uh, walks you through some of this theoretical concepts of incorporating these things in your everyday business. And that's it for me. So thank you very much, uh, Scott, Angela, and Dan. Thank you, Sandra, um, and you too, Dan. Now we're going to open the floor to questions. So if you've not already done so, you can post any questions you have in the question box. Um, and Scott will read those out as we see them. So far, we've only had one question, and I believe that has been answered already. Does anyone else have any questions for Sandra or Dan?
I have just a general um, conversation question for both Dan and Sandra. But um, in the news, we've, we've seen, you know, positive stories here and there about um, reshoring of um, manufacturing coming back to the United States or um, in our case, since we work for Diener within North Carolina, um, some processes have moved from other states here to North Carolina. Um, have uh, either you, Dan, or Sandra seen any of that um, and is part of Lean and Green part of the reason why some of those things have come back to the U.S. and or North Carolina? Hey Scott, uh, this is Dan. Um, you know, it's hard to say exactly why, but I, I, I do think that uh, I, I've, I've heard quite a bit that there does seem to be some movement within the furniture industry specifically, um, reshoring certain types of products. Um, I, I don't know how much has to do with environmental. I think right now a lot of it has to do with logistics um, issues, um, but. Certainly, there 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 is there are a segment of consumers that are very concerned about, you know, the environmental impacts that that the products that they use may have had when they were manufactured, and there is very little, if any, control, um, and really even data regarding products like that that were made overseas, particularly in the in, in the Far East, whereas stuff made here. Um, more and more there's extensive data um, that can be passed all the way on to the consumer. Um, and Scott, from our side, I mean, I haven't really seen that trend. Um, fortunately for us, uh, our manufacturing is at very, um, at its capacity. We have a high demand for trucks now. and. Um, so every plant is actually manufacturing the maximum that they can, and so everything that, you know, all the decisions that are made for us have to do with um, how we can get more capacity. Um, and of course, Lean takes that into account, but uh, we're really kind of busting at the seams right now, luckily. <laughs> Great, thank you. Great, thank you both. So a, um, a question came in here, um, are there opportunities to look at traditional office environments as ESI help businesses with those? Um, so the answer would be we have not specifically helped you with, help anyone with um, um, like paperwork exercises, but it absolutely is something that could be done um, through the lean system. So um, if that's something that you would like to work on, we're happy to oblige and, and uh, come up with a system. Um, if you don't already use um, value stream mapping, then we could uh, work with our partners um, at Waste Reduction Partners and they can help us develop a value stream map of your um, office environment and from there then we can talk through um, adding green wastes into a typical lean system. So, so we can definitely um, address those issues, um, but we have not yet done that with anyone, so it would be a great example. We'd love to do it. Hey, Angela, can, this is Sandra. Can I add something? Sure. The, um, which I've not had the opportunity to do, but I'm very curious about. On the EPA um, website, they have the carbon footprint calculator for offices mm -hmm. and it helps people look at you know how many printers you have, how many personal heaters, um, how many uh, copiers or coffee makers or that kind of thing and it helps the team kind of evaluate where they are. So that might be um, another way to actually get a baseline for um, an office setting. Yeah, that's great. All right, so there's um, there's two questions essentially um, uh, surrounding access to this training and obtaining the um, what uh, what Sandra has actually um, kind of coined for us this ESI Lean and Green Toolkit, um, and I will answer those within the um, question pane. But while I'm doing that, um, there's a question for um, specifically for Dan, but Sandra definitely. Um, so. It reads, what all does being landfill-free entail? 
Okay, so I'll read the rest of the question. What, what all does being landfill free entail, and what happens to food wastes from lunches? Right, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, for us, the, reaching the point where we could say that we were landfill free was basically when we, when we sort of cut our tether where we no longer had any, any service um, as, as far as having a dumpster or pickups. Um, you know, when, when we got to the point where there was no container here and nobody came and picked up our stuff anymore, that's sort of where we said, well, that's, that's it. We're not sending anything to the landfill. Um, food waste is definitely a difficult issue. Um, you know, in, instead of landfilling our, our trash now, because we do still have trash, it will go to a waste to energy stream. However, we cut down our trash production so much that it's going to take us somewhere between four and six months to build up a, a load of garbage to take to the waste energy facility. Um, and obviously, if you have food waste sitting around for that long, it's going to be a real problem. Um, now, one thing that we started doing last year was composting our brown paper towels that came out of the, out of the bathrooms, you know, that people use to dry their hands after they wash them. And the great thing about that is that um, that that can double as service for you know leftover half a sandwich and, and things like that. We we basically can put that stuff in there and it just goes to the composting facility. So that's how we've dealt with that. Sandra, did you want to talk about your zero waste to landfill efforts, or um, I think I mean I it's just like Dan, I mean, we, we do a variety of composting um, for cafeteria waste. And um, unfortunately, some, like, like he's saying, some of the wrappers, like if people are packing their lunch and um, this, uh, say, plastics or chips or Debbie cakes, whatever it happens to be, sometimes that um, does go to our waste um, to energy. Thank you. So we had um, one other, um, it's more of an additional um, assistance uh, from Anna Mangum from the um, NC State Industrial Extension Service. Um, they also do have um, some lean assistance as well. Um, and saying that, I also want to mention the Waste Reduction Partners, which is within our, um, our division. Thank you, Anna, for chipping in. <laughs> Yeah, and she said she specifically had a special program for lean office materials. So for the person who asked that question, um, they have experience with that. Are there any other questions? All righty. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to email them to me or Scott, and we'll address them, or we'll get them to Dan or Sandra to address. Um, and I'd once again like to thank Dan and Sandra for sharing their time and their experiences today. Um, and thank you all for joining us today, and we hope it was beneficial for you. Have a great rest of your day.